This is the way it is. Can we change it? You can be a part of the problem or you can be a part of the solution. The church has been the most racist organization. Race, religion and racism, the book. Help the church to right the wrong. This society, this nation, this world is screwed and it's screwed because of the church. We have not done what Jesus told us to do. Somebody's got to talk about this thing. We got to bring it out into the open and deal with it. Race, religion, and racism. Available in bookstores everywhere. If God is for us, who can be against us? The cruel answer for blacks coming to America, almost everyone. The Christian church in America has been the leader of racism in the world. In his new book, Race, Religion, and Racism, Volume 2, Dr. Frederick Casey Price exposes how the church deviously twisted the gospel to oppose blacks in America. When blacks were first brought to this country. The lie was hatched that blacks were inferior, really just animals. In Race, Religion, and Racism, Volume 2, Dr. Price brings years of research together, revealing how the gospel was perverted to subjugate a whole race of people. This important book can be yours for your love gift of $23.95 by calling 1-800-927-3436. Color does not matter to God because out of one blood, God made all men. Warfare and spiritual warfare. We face two very real battles. Our challenge is to see things the way they really are and help transform them into the way God intends them to be. Most of the world feels that Jehovah and Allah are the same God, but the messages and the messengers are as different as night and day. The Quran over and over and over again quotes from the Bible. The Bible never quotes from the Quran. In Race, Religion, and Racism, Volume 3, Dr. Price's passionate concern explores the essence of Islam. Muhammad had slaves. Jesus had followers. Muhammad enslaved women. Jesus healed and set them free. Race, Religion, and Racism, Volume 3. Call 1-800-927-3436. This is certainly the information you need at a time like this. Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. We're not going to turn in our Bibles yet, as I usually do. But uh, I do want to give you that are watching me by television the opportunity to support this ministry in a financial way if you see fit. I need your financial support if Ever Increasing Faith Television is to remain on the air in your area. On the screen is an address where you can mail your tithe offering or gift of love. I thank you in advance for your future support. I thank you for your present support. And I thank you for your past support. All right. Now, uh, I'm going to begin today a series of messages on a subject that is somewhat controversial and a subject which I personally believe has not been adequately dealt with from the standpoint of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as it is visibly displayed in the earth. I'm going to be teaching on race, religion, and racism. Race, religion, and racism. Now, before I begin, I need to lay the ground rules by which we will be operating. Now, unless you were with God Almighty, when he told me to do this series, unless you were with him when he gave me my instructions, 
then the best thing you can do is to put a Teflon zipper on your mouth. Okay? I know, I know what God has told me to do. Obviously, he didn't tell you to do this. So, again, unless you were with him and overheard the conversation between the Lord and myself, best thing to do is just back off, keep your hands off of it. Must not be for you, but it'll be for somebody. I'm going to uh, deal with this subject, uh, I believe, in a way that I certainly have never heard it dealt with before. And that's the reason I have this podium here. I'm going to have to do um, a lot of reading, and I hope that I have it down in such a way that I won't just have to keep my head buried in it. But I've got to do a lot of reading because the subject is so, it's so important. And I may not have, but this one time, I don't mean just today, but I mean, I may not have this, but this one time in life to deal with it. So I want to be sure that I give you the benefit of all of my research. I have been researching this situation, this particular series for just about, I guess, passionately for about three years. Okay, and it all started out as a result of certain things that I'll explain in a moment. But I, I want you to know where I'm going to be coming from, some of the words that I'll be using, some of the things that I'll be saying. And I believe that God gave this to me to say this way because of who I am and the way I am. He couldn't give it to everybody because everybody that would, don't have the capacity to be able to be this free. And uh, I will probably sound offensive to some of you, but that's not my purpose to offend. I, I may sound a little crass, uh, but that is not my purpose to be crass. Uh, I may sound angry, but my anger is a holy anger that I can base on the scripture. Right. And it's not an anger at some individual person or persons as people. Uh, so I don't want you to be intimidated, but I do want you to be informed so you can make a decision as to whether or not you want to come back to some of these sessions because they're going to be very hot and they're gonna be very heated. Some of the information that I'm gonna to present to you is gonna make some of you mad as hell. You know the hell where people go that don't know Jesus, you know that place, H-E-L-L, -L, hell, okay? I'm not using profanity, but it will, It'll make you, it's gonna make you angry. It made me angry when I found out some of this information has been hidden from us. And uh, I, I, I know that the people that are listening to me now and that will hear this message both black and white, and I'm going, to, I'm going to basically, I will be mentioning other ethnic groups, but basically in America, right now and for some time, our big problem has been this black and white thing. And we just as well admit it, and so that's what I'm going to really be uh, zeroing in on, okay? So I'll be using some terms, because I wanna, I wanna talk like you talk when you're not in church. <laughs> We're going to get right down to, to the kind of stuff you all say in the car and, and at home over the dinner table, uh, in back rooms and places where the general public doesn't hear, only because uh, I want this to be real. And I know, I know from whence I have received my instructions, and I know that the things that I am going to say are things that are real because I've heard them and you've heard them, but nobody wants to ever talk about them. But I believe that in order for us to get to the bottom of the problem so that we can come up with a solution, we're going to have to face the facts as they really are, not the way they have been painted by media and other people that don't really want to deal with the subject. So I'll be using phraseology. I'll be using words. I, I'm going to use the word white folks. So you need to find out if that's going to offend you, because I'll be using that word, white folks, white people. I'll be using the word black. I'll, I probably will use the word African-American. I'll probably use the word Negro. And I'll probably use the word nigger, because that's the way y'all talk. And so don't try, to, don't try to fool the kid, because I've been there and I know just how people talk. Black folk call us niggers and Black and, and white folks call us niggers. You know it and I know it, and, and I want you to be completely at ease about it because I'm going to use these terms. Now, you may say, well, Pastor, you don't have to say that. Wait a minute, you wait till you get the assignment, and then you say what you believe God has you to say and leave me alone, okay? Okay, don't, don't tell me what I'm not supposed to say. And if you don't want to hear it, you got two choices. There are 32 doors in this faith dome that lead to the street. You don't have to come back. And on your TV, there is an off and 
on button, also an up channel and a down channel. And so if this is not for you, don't fall out about it. Just flip your channels and grab you a game or something. This is only for those that have ears to hear. Okay? Because uh, we got a real problem, and we're going to deal with it uh, at length. Now, so I just want you be, to be aware of that. I'm not trying to be vulgar, and, and I'm not trying to just be, you know, I, you know, there are a lot of ways you could say things, but some things you say will really get across to people more than other things if you say them in another way. Okay? So uh, I just want you to be aware of some of these things so that you won't be uh, offended. Also, uh, I will not read. Hear me well now. I will not read any clandestine letters that you send me, okay? Unless you put your name on it and your mailing address, whether it's a positive letter or a negative letter, I'm not going to read it unless it has name and address on it because I will reserve the right that if you send me a letter that I'm not asking you to send me, then I have the right to read your letter in public. So I'm going to read it if it's, if it's, you know, some, I think it's something that can help us or just to show more so what I'm talking about is true. I may read the letter, okay? But I'm going to have my office and my people, if a letter comes in anonymously, and we've gotten letters like this in the past, if the letter comes in anonymously and it doesn't have your name on it and your return mailing address, I'm not even going to read it. I ain't got time. I don't have time. And like I said, if you disagree with what I'm saying, then like I said, you don't come here and turn the TV on. It's not for you. It's only for the people that have ears to hear. And God has some people that are ready to hear this. Amen. Okay? Now, a lot of this problem is it's, it's historical and it started a long time ago. You didn't cause it and I didn't cause it. But we're living in it, in the aftermath of it. And a lot of the things that are going on is because nobody really knows how it all started. See, if you don't know how something started, then you can't make any repairs to it because you don't know its origin, see? So we're going to have to go way back and deal with some stuff. And I'm telling you some stuff. I'm te- I, I got some stuff to, to throw on you, to lay on you, that if you have curly hair, it will straighten your hair. <laughs> and if you have straight hair, it'll put a curl in your hair. And if you don't have no hair, it'll grow some hair. <laughs> Yeah, I kid you not. All right. Now, enough of that. I was born in uh, Santa Monica, California. I've lived in the Los Angeles area all my life. When I came into the world, we lived at 1619 Broadway in the city of Santa Monica. It was primarily at that time a white city based on its population. There was a small area of about eight square blocks where blacks lived. There were some other scattered blacks in other parts of the city of Santa Monica, but the the, the largest concentration of the few of us that were there were in about an eight square block area. And uh, when I came on the scene, things were separate. Uh, There were certain areas in Santa Monica black folk didn't go. In fact, in Santa Monica, we could not go to the beach. We could not go to the beach, play on the sand, and go in the ocean. There was a certain section that they had set out for black people. It was about a block wide, and that was it. And you couldn't go to the right or to the left. You had to go right in that one area. Well, again, when I got here, it was like that. So, you know, me, I'm a kid. I just accepted. I figured this is the way it must be. Well, I I saw around the city, I saw white churches and I saw black churches and then there were a few uh, uh, Hispanic churches uh, in certain parts of the city and uh, the twain never mixed. Again, I thought this was, must be the way it's supposed to be, you know. Well, I was not brought up in what you would call a Christian home. I had no real exposure to the church, uh, so I didn't know that much about it, but I would, some of the friends that I went with, uh, or palled around with their parents, went to church, et cetera, et cetera. So I heard some things about it. I heard little names here and names there and certain things like this, you know, like Jesus is the only way and Jesus is the way and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I had a lot of questions. 
I was a very inquisitive person, still am, and, and, and I would ask questions, but I couldn't get any answers. Nobody had any answers for me. I couldn't figure out why do we, how come us black folk have to live in this area? How come I can't live up there across that particular boulevard? All white over there and all black over here. I didn't understand that. And nobody really seemed to have an answer. They just said, well, that's the way it's always been. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know. So I just, you know, I accepted that. So anyway, I grew up uh, in that environment. Had no real uh, exposure to Christianity. Heard about it, but didn't have any exposure to it. Then uh, as I grew older, finally, uh, I married, and uh, my wife was a Christian. Uh, I went to church with her while we were courting because I was trying to make points. <laughs> and uh, I wanted her and her parents to think that I was a, a nice guy, which I was, I, but I was, I was a nice heathen. You know, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't a nice Christian. I was a, a, a you know, rank sinner, just a rank sinner. And of course, her church uh, didn't teach anything and so she didn't know that she shouldn't be involved with me from a biblical perspective. But, you know, God, God, God will help us when we don't know. He, he'll help us when he knows we don't know. It's when we know and won't do that God ain't going to give you a squat. He won't help you then. Okay? And so anyway, we, get, we finally married. And so um, I, I got uh, saved, born again. I accepted Christ in a tent revival meeting, like a circus tent Oh, raggedy, wooden, rickety chairs and sawdust all over the floor. But I had a real live experience with Jesus Christ. I was born again. And in the back of the main tent, they had the, uh, the what they call the counseling tent, where people that came forward in the invitation would be taken to be uh, uh, counseled with and instructions given to them about the decision that they had made and what it all meant. Well, I went back to this tent, and it just so happened the way the, the people that were there that night, everybody basically was white. It was just two or three of us that were black. And so my counselor was a white person and happened to be a minister of the gospel, happened to be a teacher in one of the Bible colleges here in the city, uh, in Southern California, and also had a daily radio broadcast on the radio as a Bible teacher. And so uh, we talked, and, and he asked me why I came forward, and I just told him, you know, what had happened to him. I mean, it was, I was really overcome. And uh, so um, he asked me, did I have any questions? He explained some things to me, then asked me, did I have some questions? And, and I did. I had some questions. I said, I, I don't understand why and how this Jesus uh, that I've just received, that how, how he's the way, the truth, and the life, how he's the answer, and, and yet everything is segregated. I, I, is, there, is, is heaven going to be like that? Is going to be a segregated heaven? Well, he took the Bible and uh, showed me from the Bible that segregation was the will of God. Uh, he showed me from the Bible that it was God's will for the races to be separated. And see, if you don't know the Bible, it can be misconstrued that way. See, if you don't, it can be twisted. If you don't know, and of course, he's a minister and white too. You know the white folks know what's going on. Uh, now see, when I do, when I say these kind of things, don't be offended. I'm not talking to any individual person, okay? I'm talking about a, 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 a system. I'm talking about a condition that exists in our society, our society, and you're lying through your teeth if you say it's not so. So don't get on your high horses and try to get offended by it. You know better. You know better. And so anyway, uh, and this is the way black people have been raised in this country, to believe that the white man got all the answers and knows everything, and we don't know nothing. Okay, and that's just that's the way we've been taught and brought up traditionally. It's a fact, okay? And so anyway, I figured this man must know, number one, he's white. Number two, he's a minister of the gospel. Number three, he's got a radio broadcast teaching on the radio. And number four, he's a teacher in a Bible institute. Now, you know he knows. So I accepted it. Didn't like it, but I accepted it. Because it seemed to make sense because that's what history looked like. So I, it seemed like, well, it's valid. So I don't like it. But the, so I wanted out of here. You know, I was looking for the day when, when I'd get out of here, go to heaven. So there wouldn't be this kind of thing. So anyway, time went on. And uh, as I say, I married. And, uh, and they instructed us to go, instructed me to join a church. I need to be a part of a church. My wife was from a Baptist background. And so that was all she was familiar with. So we went to a Baptist church. I joined a church. And I guess just a few days after I joined, I'd been there just a um, a little while, I had a, I had a divine encounter. You remember the story in the Bible, in the, in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, where Paul was on his way to Damascus 
to, to bring Christians, bind them, put them up in bondage, and have some of them killed, put in prison, etc. And, and Paul, the bright light shone around him, and he fell off the horse, and he heard this voice, and Jesus was talking to him. Well, I had an experience. It wasn't quite exactly like that, but I had an experience that was very real to me. Um, I was in a church, in this church setting, and um, to make a long story short, Jesus Christ spoke to me. Now, at that time, I didn't know what it was because I had no knowledge. But as I've gone back to read the Old Testament, I would re you read over there many times where the prophets would say, and the word of the Lord came to me saying. Anybody ever read that? Yeah. Said, and the word of the Lord came to me saying. And then the prophet would say, thus saith the Lord. Okay. Well, the word of the Lord came to me saying. I heard this voice. I, I don't mean a thought passed through my mind. I mean, I heard a voice just like you hear me right this moment. The only difference was I didn't see anybody. And the voice had direction to it. I thought somebody was over here in the part of the building speaking to me. So I turned to see who it was. It wasn't anybody in that part of the building. Actually, it happened to be the choir stand, and Sunday night the choir didn't sing, so it was vacated. But I heard the voice just as distinct, just as loud, just as real. I thought everybody in the building heard the voice. And the voice said, you are to preach my gospel. And I turned to see who it was. Didn't see anybody. And I didn't know what on earth this was. Well, anyway, I told my wife and I, I told the minister, and that was, that was my call to the ministry. Now, I matriculated through several denominations up to a certain time. In the year 1970, um, I became acquainted with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I got filled with the Spirit, speaking with other tongues, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And my whole perception of God, of Jesus, of the Bible, everything just changed. And I had, a, I had a, a, just a revelation of things. And, and, and the, the, the teaching gift was dropped into my spirit. And from that point on, all I wanted to do was teach the Word. Now, I didn't have a lot of knowledge at the time. So I taught the bits and pieces that I had. But as I gave myself to the study of the word, then that knowledge increased and increased and increased. Well, again, I, I was confronted with this thing about uh, racism, about racial prejudice. And uh, I didn't like it. And as I began to read the word, I thought that there was a place in God where people could come spiritually and get to that point, And then ethnicity wouldn't, ma wouldn't matter. People's color would be irrelevant and immaterial. But I was sadly and rudely awakened to find out that it doesn't seem to matter how high people get spiritually, they can still have these chinks in their armor, if you would. They can have problems. Now, I had something happen to me that was very traumatic, and I'll, exp I'll explain that in a little bit. And um, that really awakened me and was the catalyst for me to go ahead and to prepare this teaching. Because as I've traveled all over the world ministering the word, I find that people have these problems and nobody, nobody wants to face it. Everybody wants to just shun it off as though it didn't happen and not really get down to deal with the nitty nitty gritty, the real stuff on the inside. And so that's sort of a, a background of how I started. Now, in 1990, August the 29th, I received a letter. And I quote, Dear Pastor Price, I hope you actually get to read this letter yourself and not a secretary who reads this and then responds with another computer-generated letter. In May, I attended the West Coast Believers Convention in Anaheim, California. You preached on faith worketh by love. Pastor Price, I need to ask you to forgive me for not loving you. I did not love you because of your skin color. I did not want to listen to you because of your skin color. In all actuality, I hated you simply because of your skin color. I asked the Lord to forgive me, and I know that I have been forgiven of my bigotry from the Lord. But Pastor Price, I would also like to know that you have forgiven me as well. It would be greatly appreciated. You also prayed at the end of your message for us as a body to receive prosperity promotions at work, etc. I cannot remember the rest of the prayer. Anyways, I wanted you to know that I received a promotion at work. Along with the promotion came an increase in pay. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Price, for praying that prayer. Thank you for your time and your consideration. I'm looking forward 
to hearing from you at your earliest convenient, your brother in Christ, P-E-R. Well, obviously, I forgave the brother. I couldn't hold anything against him. I couldn't be a Christian and hold something against the man. You know, I knew he did it out of ignorance, but at least he asked my forgiveness, and I gave it to him. Then in July, that was 1990. Then in July of 1995, Charisma magazine printed an article entitled, When Love Crosses the Color Line. In August of the same year, in a section of the magazine called Letters, some response to the Color Line article were printed. And I quote, I am highly offended by your articles on interracial marriage. It is wrong to marry out of your race. Jesus knows this. Since it lowers the physical standard in races, what about the offspring? Name withheld. From Centronelle, Alabama. Now, I want you to listen to these because these things are symptomatic. And if you're wise and a student listening, you'll hear where our real problems are. Another letter that was in that same uh, letter section of Charisma, and I quote, I was so disappointed when I received your July issue promoting interracial marriage. And if that wasn't bad enough, you said Moses married a Negro. <laughs> if you take the time to study your history, you'd, you'd see that there were different races in Midian at different times. What you publish is just another lie. We marry after our own kind if we want to be pleasing to God. May God open your eyes and show you the truth. End of quote. Mary Merrill from New Hebron, Mississippi. I guess she has never read Numbers 12. Turn there quickly. Numbers 12. Because, see, this is a part of the problem that we're having in America. Has been the problem since the inception of this nation. Now, notice what the lady said. When they said that Moses married a Negro, this lady said, what you publish is just another lie. We marry after our own kind, if you want to be pleasing to God. See, this is where this thing all got started. Notice how God is interwoven with this business of people's personal individual prejudices. Now, let me also stick a pin here and say this to you. Um, there are three sections to this series, race, religion, and racism. And, and I'll be dealing with these sections. Uh, actually, this is my introduction. But in racism, I'll be dealing with it, and I'll be giving a definition. Now, a lot of people have different, a different slant on these things. But let me tell you what I mean when I use the term so that you'll understand where I'm coming from. I basically want to zero in on racial, ethnic prejudice. Okay? That has been captured under the overall umbrella of racism. And so most of the time on the street when somebody says racism, they mean racial prejudice. And when we say racism and racial prejudice in America, we prim primarily mean black and white. Now that, it goes other places. I, I'm aware of that. But I'm talking about the big thing, the big issue here is this black and white thing. Okay? And this letter, this, this person's response, you get an inkling of that when you're talking about marry after our own, our own kind. The first letter which said, uh, what about the offspring? See, this is the issue that nobody has wanted to deal with because America is shot through with this idea that black people are inferior genetically. They are inferior based on their blood. And this is why there's this big thing about interracial marriage. Now, I'm going to get into that a little while later. I, get, I could give a care about interracial marriage. I'm not even interested in it one way or the other. I'm not pro. I'm not con. I'm neutral on the subject. But I got to get to that subject because that's the big hang-up that most white folks have about black people. That's the big bugaboo. 
Because blacks are inferior, therefore their blood is inferior. Because see, way back in time when this thing was first hatched here in this country, they thought that the, the disposition of a person and their quality and their character was transmitted in the blood because they didn't understand genetics at that time. So they thought this was a blood thing. So if you mix white blood and black blood, since black blood is inferior blood, then you take it and put it into superior white blood, then you taint the white blood and the white blood ain't pure anymore. So we gotta keep these races apart. Sure got quiet. <laughs> now it's gonna get worse. But here, here, uh, Numbers 12 and 1 says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. <laughs> now, if I understand Ethiopia, Ethiopia is not made up of white folks. <laughs> Ethiopia is made up of black folk, and Ethiopia is on the continent of Africa, Amen. not Europe. Yes. Africa. Amen. And Ethiopians are as dark as me or darker. Okay? And Moses married one. And if you notice very carefully, if you read about it, God didn't say anything about it. In fact, Aaron and Miriam got on Moses' case about it, and God struck Miriam with leprosy. <laughs> Moses was God's man. And yet, there it is right in the Bible, he married an Ethiopian. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not into interracial marriage right now, and I'm not, I'm not promoting it. I, I, I have a section here, I'm going to deal with it. Hopefully, I get to it. But, but, but this is what's coming out of these responses by these people. And I'm sure that people that are watching me right now, maybe some in this auditorium, you got the same kind of attitude. And that's where this whole thing stems from, see? White people in America, see, some of you don't even know this, but... Your ancestors taught it, and it's been promulgated down through time. Very subtly, it's not big neon signs that are hung out, you know what I'm talking about, but it's in the family, and you get this idea, and it's, you're brought up this way. Many, many, not everybody, I know that. So you don't have to write me a letter and tell me you were not brought up that way. But some have been brought up that way. You know it, and I know it, and I got documentation that's going to show you. Okay? And that's this thing that white people are superior and black people are inferior. This is just the way it is. And this is the real crux of our matter, our, uh, the, the matter. And we all, everybody's talking all about this reconciliation stuff and all this. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I appreciate people's efforts. At least they make, they're making an effort to do something. But reconciliation is not the issue. Peace. Not reconciliation, recognition. Amen. Amen. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I got, I got so much, I get, a, I get a little hit. But let me go here. So we see that Moses married a black woman. Apparently it was all right with God because he didn't, he didn't criticize Moses for it. Now, it was, it was reported to me. See, this, racial, this racist thing, racial prejudice, not just, in, not just in white folks. It was reported to me that this incident took place here at Crenshaw Center. One of our ushers, I'm quoting now, one of our ushers was filling an empty seat in, in the area where the pastors are seated. That's over in this area here or where they're located, where their seating is located. He seated a Hispanic brother in an in seat, and the next person to be seated was a black lady. The usher gestured to the next seat to the Hispanic brother, or to the seat next to the Hispanic brother, and the lady said, I don't want to sit by him. I want to sit by a black person. Yeah, right here in Crenshaw Christian Center. To me, that's racism. See, to me, racism is racism. I don't care who it is. Black against white, white against black, white against white, black against white, black against red, red against brown, brown against yellow. Racism is racism. Racial prejudice is racial prejudice. It all stinks and smells like garbage. Okay? I don't care who it is. But I'm just, I want you to be sure you understand this. Now I'm ready to play the KKK tape. I had, uh, somebody gave me a telephone number, and I called this number. And this is what I heard. See, I'm not talking about ancient history now. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, uh, I think this was last year, towards the end of last year. Roll the tape. I hope this will work. White pride, white man fight back. If you've been watching the news lately, you've heard that there is evidence of the CIA bringing cocaine into the U.S. and funneling it into nigger towns to raise money for the rebels in Nicaragua. In plain English, the government made drugs available to niggers drugs which made the niggers more violent and dangerous. 
It would be like the CIA injecting animals with rabies and turning them loose in our communities. The government is so corrupt and evil, one wonders how much longer God's wrath upon America will be withheld. When you take primitive, emotional creatures like Negroes and dope them up, you create a dangerous, violent, criminal animal that robs and kills for crack money. CIA scumbags and scumbags like Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, who seem to have been in on the CIA drug-running operations, should be put on trial for treason. On top of all that, we have Clinton, a president who supports a form of abortion which kills a baby as it's being born by sucking its brain out and crushing the skull. If anyone did that to a dog, the whole country would be outraged. The president is evil and corrupt. Vote scumbag Clinton out in November 96. Vote for Dole. At least Dole is against killing babies. This has been J.D. Alders, the voice of the Klan, reminding you that it's all right to be white. Okay, I, I hope you could hear that. I think I, I've got this written down. I, want, I wanted you to get that because, see, this is the kind of thing that... Let's see, did I... I don't think I... I don't think I... Could you hear that tape all right? Yeah. It, was a little it was a little difficult, but uh, uh, I, hope you, I hope you could hear it. You hear, you hear how they talk about the niggers? They even call it nigger town. <laughs> so I, I'm just trying to show you, they ain't the only one that do that. They're just the only ones that got the gut to come out in the open and say it. I have to respect them for that. I don't agree with their philosophy, but at least they're not two-faced like the church, like Christians. Amen. Now, the purpose, the purpose that I wanted to, you to hear the tape is because this statement is symptomatic. And tells us in no uncertain terms that there is a problem, a racial, ethnic, and color problem in America. And it cannot be denied. Now, that by itself is bad news indeed. But when you compound it with the fact that this racial, ethnic, and color problem exists in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it becomes a tragedy of enormous proportions. Now, why do I say that? Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, you are the salt of the earth. And then look at verse 14. It says, you are the light of the world. In other words, the church is supposed to be the salt of the earth. The church is supposed to be the light of the world. Now, I want you to get this. Jesus said, you are the what? Salt of the earth. He said, you are the light of the world. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say, you're the salt of the church. He did not say, you're the light of the church. He said, you are the light of the world. Amen. And that's why the world and this society here in America is so screwed up because the church is just as racist as the secular area, and the secular area has no reason to clean up their act because the church is acting just like them. Instead of us being the light of the world, we have thought that Jesus meant the tail light, but he actually meant we ought to be the headlight. He said we're the light, which means we ought to be leading. And we have, and the world has learned the lesson well. They're just as racist as the church is. See, that's where it started. See, Jesus said, we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We ought to be leading. Instead of doing that, we're giving them a bad example because there's so much of it right here in the church. And so that's why it can exist in society the way it has. And it all started in the very beginning. We'll get into that later. But it all started in the very beginning when the preachers got into league with the slave owners. And the church sanctioned slavery. The church. 
They, 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 that's the only reason slavery could exist, because the church gave the slave owners the courage to be able to exercise slavery and call themselves Christians. And so that's the reason why so many people down through the years, and especially we see it in great numbers in our time, have been leaving Christianity, especially people of color, because they're saying that Christianity is a slave owner's white man's religion, and it got that reputation by the church as a body in total. That's not to say that there have not been genuine individuals down through history who spoke out. But you need more than one person to speak out. You need the whole church to get in line with the program in a positive way. Instead of that, they condoned it. And so then a lot of people are leaving Christianity or don't want to have anything to do with Christianity because they call it the slave owner's religion. Well, listen, just because somebody takes something and misuses it doesn't mean that the thing misused was anything wrong with that. It's the way the person who took it used it. That's what made it wrong. They're wrong, not the thing itself. I've seen people take automobiles, drive up to a bank, rob the bank, shoot people, kill people, steal the money, and drive off. Ain't nothing wrong with the car. It's the robbers you want to get to, not the car. Don't ban all those automobiles. That was just a vehicle that was used by the criminals. So just because somebody who called themselves a Christian, people can go to a church, join a church, get so-called baptized or confirmed or reaffirmed or catechized and all that other kind of stuff and call themselves Christian. That don't mean they're Christians. Because real Christians don't do that. People that have really been born again. So you've got a lot of people, I call them professional Christians. They have all the outward trappings. They can look to look. They can talk to talk. But they don't know how to walk to walk because nothing's ever happened to them on the inside. They are religious Christians, but they're not born-again Christians. And there is a big difference between the two. So don't throw out Christianity just because some people use it in a bank robbery. I mean, because people took it and misused it. Better check it out. Jesus said, we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. Not the salt of the church, not the light of the church. Salt of the earth, light of the earth. And I, as I said, it looked like the church thought he meant the tail light, but he meant the headlight. Now, in racial or in reference to racial, ethnic, color issues that face all humanity, instead of dealing with it, the church has just acted like it wasn't there instead of facing the issue and dealing with it from an unprejudiced biblical point of view. The church historically, and sad to say even up to this present time, has adopted the ostrich syndrome and has hidden its head in the sand. I'm here to tell you that that day is over. Right. Over. If there is any truth in any passage of scripture found in the Bible. It is in 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's turn there. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Let me say it again. If there is any truth in any passage of Scripture found in the Bible, it is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, which says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Judgment day has arrived. We are on the threshold of it now. You will never, ever be the same after this series is over. We cannot any longer do business as usual. We're going to have to shape up or ship out. The attitude of the Christian towards racial, ethnic, and color differences in mankind should be the same as God's. Now, I want you to notice, we read those two letters that were responses to that article in Charisma Magazine. You remember the letters? 
And, and you could see what was seething in those letters. They, they had a real negative attitude towards this interracial thing. Now, again, I'll get to that later. I'm not, I'm not pushing it one way or the other. Uh, but I want you to see that that's really, that's the underlying reason for all this other stuff. The other stuff is a smokescreen. The real issue is black folk are inferior and white folk are superior. Now, that's just the plain truth. That's the bottom line of it. All the other stuff is a dodge. It's all an excuse so that you can not deal with this part, but just say, well, they're, you know, they're violent. Like, like my clan brother here just got through saying, when you take Negroes and, and fill them up with crack, then they become vicious animals. That's his, that's their opinion. A lot of white people have that idea. And they talk about it in private, but they don't talk about it in public. See, I'm, I'm a, that's why God gave me this assignment. Because, see, I'm straightforward. What you see is what you get. Like it or lump it, take it or leave it. I don't have any hidden agendas. And I can deal with this thing because you don't scare me. Amen. Amen. See? And so that's the, kind, that's the reason why most people won't deal with it because they, they're scared. People are going, well, people may not stop. If you stop coming, somebody else will. Amen. And it, hey, guess what? And if they don't come, I'll go do something else. I, would, I didn't come out of my mother's womb preaching the gospel. I know how to do other things, so I'm not intimidated, see? But somebody got to deal with this, and this is a real stuff. This is a real issue. All the other things come out of that and are used as a smoke screen as to why we shouldn't do this and so. But this be the real nitty-gritty issue. Okay, but our attitude as Christians towards racial and ethnic color differences in mankind should be the same as God's. We're supposed to be the children of God, right? Church is supposed to be the children of God, right? We're supposed to be the body of Christ, right? Yes. So our attitude towards any ethnic group ought to be the same as God's. Does that seem reasonable? Maybe the problem with the church is the church has never really found out how God thinks. See, what people have done is try to bring God down to their preconceived prejudiced ideas. But the way you have to do it is we got to bring our ideas up to the level of where God is. And if they don't square with God, we're going to have to change it. And that's where the problem has been. We've been bringing God down to our level, and that's what's turned a lot of people off from Jesus is because of what they have seen coming out of so-called people that believe in God. And see, the crucible of all of our Christianity has to be manifested in the way I treat you and in the way you treat me. How we treat each other, in other words. That's the bottom line. All the rest of the stuff, smokescreen. It, it, it means nothing. How do I treat you? How do you treat me? How do I view you? How do you view me? Everything I claim to believe as a Christian has to be lived out. I can't live it out on a desert island by myself. I have to live it out in ex inner exchange with you and you with me. Now, how I act towards you, how you act towards me, how you see me, how I see you, that's the real test of the Christianity that we claim to have. How do we treat each other? How do we see each other? How do we view each other? That's the real bottom line test. Now, let's look at how God sees humanity. Because think about this. God, <laughs> to turn to Acts chapter 10. God is the creator. Now, when we, get into, when we get into the religion section of this message, I'm going to show you documented uh, instances from so-called Christian people that tell us that black folk were not the original creation of God. Yeah, I got it documented. It tried to hide all this stuff, but I found it out. <laughs> pitiful. Uh, I mean, it, it's pitiful. It's pit Some of the stuff that I'm going to, to, to show you, read to you, I'm going to give you book, publisher's date, page number, yeah. author's name. That's why it took me so long to get This is all going to be documented. I don't want to hear nothing about, well, I, that, that ain't true. I'm going to stuff it down your throat. I'm going to give it to you in black and white, as they say. Okay? Let me show you page number. Publisher, publisher's date, 
title of the book, author's name. So you can go check it out for yourself. We were not considered a part of the original creation. We're some kind of extracurricular creation. <laughs> oh, it's pitiful. It is pitiful. And the church, the church promulgated this in the beginning. And that's how they justified a part of how they justified slavery. Because they say they're, 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 black people are just animals. In fact, we're doing them a favor, bringing them from Africa and putting them in chains. Because if they were there, they'd just be swinging from trees and bathing in the river, you know, and, and, and running around with loincloths on, no clothes. And See, so we've done them a favor, bringing them here and putting them in slavery. At least we give them some clothes to wear. A little shack to stay in. It's awful. But we, we got to have, as Christians, we have to have the same attitude that God has about people. And there needs to be, when it talks about judgment beginning at the house of God, there's a tremendous house cleaning that needs to be done. Because people got all kind of hang-ups in Just like with, I mean, black folk got it. White folks got it. And both of them are wrong. White Christians, black Christians. Both wrong. Now watch this. Acts chapter 10, verse... What did I say? Acts chapter 10, right? That's what I said. Acts chapter 10. Right? 10, 1 after 9. How many heard 10? Thank you. The rest of you didn't hear nothing. <laughs> Let's don't go to this Joshua thing again. <laughs> no, don't give me Joshua again. Okay? Acts chapter 10. T-I-N. 10. Okay. Now, this was, this was the apostle Peter. Peter was a strict Orthodox Jew. Hebrew Israelite, whichever term suits you best. And he was <coughs> prejudiced against Gentiles. And actually didn't even think Gentiles could get saved. Peter thought that Christ came for Israel and Israel alone. Anyway, you may have remembered the story where Peter was up on a house and God let a big sheet down from heaven with all these animals on it what they call clean and unclean from a ceremonial point of view from the Jewish faith or religion. And God told him to rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, oh, no, 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 no. Nothing ever common or unclean has ever come into my mouth. And God said, listen, what I have cleansed, don't you call that common and unclean. And the thing went up three times. And then right at that time, three Gentiles who would be considered by a Jew at that time as ceremonially unclean, couldn't have anything to do with them. Anyway, so Peter went with these people, and it was another Gentile man that God had spoken to to send for Peter. Anyway, when he got on the scene, this is, this was, this is God's attitude towards ethnics, ethnic groups. You know, we talk about, the, and, and I'll get into this when I get finished with the introduction, the first section is going to be race. And when we get into race, we're going to find out there's only one race. There is no such thing as the black race. There is no such thing as the white race. That's a lie. There is no such thing as the white race, black race, yellow race, red, red race, or brown race. There's only one race. They're different, just different shadings of the same race. Because if there's a different race, then that would mean it had to be five different creations. Either we all from the same source or there's five different creations. A black one, a white one, a red one, a brown one, and a yellow one. I can't find but one in the book. Okay, watch this now. Uh, verse 34 and 35. Then Peter, he, he had come to the Gentile's house, and the man told him why he had sent for him, and, and the fact that he had seen a vision and seen an angel in his house. And, and then Peter opened his mouth and said, I, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Now, in the traditional, I'm reading from the New King James Version, for the benefit of those of you who don't know it. And if you're reading from the traditional King James Version, it calls it no respecter of persons. But same thing, no partiality, no respecter of persons. But listen, verse 35, but in every nation. How many nations? Well, well, wouldn't that have to be black nations? If it's every nation, wouldn't, they have to, wouldn't black nations have to be included? I said... If it says nation, wouldn't black nation have to be included? Amen. White nations, yes. red, yes. brown, yes. yellow, yes. all. Yes. But in every nation, 
How much is left out of every? None. That's an inclusive term. Every nation. Say every. every. Say it again. Every, every nation. Every Say it again. Every Say it again. Every Say it again. Every Say it again. Every Black nation. Black nation. White nation. White nation. Brown nation, Brown. red nation, red. yellow nation, yellow. All, nations. all nations. Okay, watch this now. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, I, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality or is no respect of person, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now, friend, if I'm a part of the black nation and it includes all nations and it includes me, and if I work righteousness and I do the will, plan, and purpose of God, if I'm accepted by God, who do you think you are that you should not accept me Amen. in the face of this? Amen. Peter said, I perceive God is no, shows no partiality. If God doesn't, how can you? Why should you? See, unless you got a problem. God, this is God's attitude towards the nations. He shows no partiality. All right, look at the 17th chapter of Acts. You're right there in the book of Acts, a few more chapters over. 17. Now, this is just the introduction, and I, and I got a long way to go in the introduction. I thought I was going to get further than this, but, but I got to take this thing step by step. See, I have to build on this. I got to build on it. 17th chapter of... of um, Acts, all right? Look at verse 24, beginning with verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. But I need to quit. Would you believe I am out of time? Bye. Race, religion, and racism is an important, well-researched, admirably reasoned, and friendly contribution on the subject of racism. A must-read for all society and every household. It should be included in the curriculum of high schools and universities throughout the world. Pastor Price is a modern-day John the Baptist, exposing hypocrisy and religiosity that will lead some to rejoice and others to repent. My father would commend Dr. Price. He has helped move in a positive direction in a very short period of time. This is a, a breath of fresh air. Race, Religion, and Racism, Volume 2. Call 800-927-3436. The time is always right to do that which is right. We have fought in every single war. We have been butchered and destroyed and shot up and come back to this country and couldn't even get a job. Just because we were black. Race, religion, and racism. Expose the lies. Expose the truth. Experience the healing. We should, as Christians, regard no man after the flesh. And what a wonderful witness we would make as Christians if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ did that. What an impact it would make on the world. But the world has looked at the church and the church has been more divided, sectarian, racist, and prejudiced than any other institution. Get the very best of this epic lesson series by Dr. Frederick Casey Price on nine CDs for your love gift of $44.95 or more. These are the most popular lessons from this series as decided by you, the viewer. Out of one blood, God made every man to dwell on this earth. Order this nine CD set by calling the number on your screen or write to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. The Race, Religion, and Racism book series. Book one, a bold encounter with division in the church, candidly exposes the role of the early American church in permitting and in some cases even encouraging slavery on these shores. Book two, Perverting the gospel to subjugate a people boldly deals with the rampant racism that survived and thrived after the abolition of slavery. Book three, Jesus, Christianity, and Islam takes an unflinching look at the role of Muslims in the world today, especially in light of recent events. Dr. Price undertakes an eye-opening consumer report style comparison between Islam and Christianity. 
Each deluxe hardcover volume of Race, Religion, and Racism is available for just $23.95. But right now, and only through this exclusive television offer, you can own all three life-changing books for your love gift of $54.95 or more. This program is produced by Ever-Increasing Faith Ministries and you, our faithful friends and partners in this area.